Hello, this is Chris Helton from the Dorkland blog, and I'm coming to you tonight with uh, another one of my Dorkland uh, roundtables, this time uh, from Adamant Entertainment and uh, Cubicle 7. I have Garrett Skarka. Oh, and, and uh, Google seems to like you enough that it added you twice to this Hangout. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, when the when the chime went, I got booted. So. Oh, lovely. <clears throat> well, thank you uh, very much for for um, taking the time out to do this. Hopefully, um, uh, Google won't be uh, a pain in the ass with this tonight, as it already seems to be starting out. Um, let's get right to the meat of things. Um, what I typically like to start these off with is asking people. Um, how they started out as a gamer, what their first game was, um, you know, roughly when they started, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, well, I was uh, in fifth grade, I think, and so that was in the early, early, early 80s, like 81, and I was, or at M, a huge James Bond fan, and uh, one of my friends for my birthday in June of that year got me a uh, copy of TSR's first edition uh, Top Secret box set, the the pre the pre Top Secret SI, you know the good one, right? Um, <laughs> uh, written by Merle Rasmussen with art by Errol Otis and Jeff D and and I ate it up. Didn't really understand how to play it. Um, Most of us that, didn't. Yeah, for the first <laughs> few months, I think we actually we were actually trying to use the the map of uh, Sprechen Haltestella as a game board, <laughs> where we were like you know using spitballs to mark our locations, and um, and it wasn't until six months later for Christmas that my parents got me a copy of the Moldvay basic set of D&D and suddenly everything was clear and I looked back at T I looked back at top secret and went oh I get it now <laughs> um, so despite the fact that I got D&D for Christmas it actually led me to play more top secret um, so yeah I'm a bit of an anomaly that way I mean most 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 gamers of, of my generation, when I uh, when I talk to them, they say that D and D was their first game, and, and I sort of came at it sideways. Yeah, I, as I say, because I beat you by a couple of years, and at at that point in time, a lot of those newfangled games just really weren't an option. I, but the only thing I remember being locally available, other than the D and D stuff, was like the first edition of Gamma World, and right. er, everyone just looked at that and was like, "Well, why are we playing giant bunnies?" Yeah. <laughs> I went. I went. Top Secret, D and D, then um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons stuff. You know, uh, like I picked up a player's handbook and started to try to bring in like psionic rangers into my basic D and D game. Um, and yeah. then at that point, it was uh, you know TSR was really uh, full steam ahead at that point. So. In rapid succession, it was it was Star Frontiers and Gamma World, and 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 uh, then branching out into non TSR games like SPI's Universe and and uh, Fasso's Star Trek and Traveler, and it, I haven't looked back. Yeah. So as as a as a Bond fan, did you play the um, the uh, Avalon Hill uh, James Bond game? Yep, their Victory Games imprint. Yep. Um, that actually is the reason that I'm a game designer. Um, the Victory Hill, uh, the, the uh, Avalon Hills Victory Games, uh, James Bond 007, uh, designed by, I think his name is Jerry Klug, Jerry Klug, never That's been sure how to yeah. pronounce it, um, was the first game, I was devouring games at that point. I wasn't playing a whole lot of them, but I was. if there was a game, I bought it. And um, the James Bond game was the first game I had ever seen that actually did genre emulation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chase rules and the seduction rules and everything else 
were designed not only for play, but to actually feel like the stuff you saw in the movies. And that was like opening a door in my head. It was, it was, I had no idea that you could do that. I always thought of, of game rules as sort of, you know, what I had seen in Top Secret and, and, and D&D, which is just sort of mathematical models of action. Something. Yeah. And to see that you could also take into account uh, emulation was was a revelation for me, and it made me want to start designing games, which I did soon afterwards. So, what was uh, what was your first, and I'm sure uh, um, very well done uh, game design? Um, well, actually, my first war game design predates my first RPG design. I had. Um, I had seen a bunch of war games and stuff at the stores that I that I had been to. I hadn't bought any, and this was also the beginning of of uh, you know rudimentary uh, computer games and things like that. But I didn't have the wherewithal to do any programming. But I was interested in the war gaming concept, and so I decided that I was going to develop a war game, a near future war game, and that the easiest way for me to do that was to just basically use a real world map as the game board. Unfortunately, I was at my grandmother's house and it was the summertime and the only map that I could find was in a recent issue of National Geographic and it was a map of Canada. <laughs> so using a National Geographic map of Canada and a set of Avery labels, I uh, made a war game, which was really sort of like a hyper-violent version of Candyland, actually, because it was just like... <laughs> little paths marked out in Avery labels that you moved your pieces along. But uh, I ended up, it, it was it was an early example of, of, uh, of ret retconning. I developed a backstory to match the map I had, which was that we discovered the Canadians had been illegally tapping into the Alaska pipeline, and so we were invading. And, <laughs> and the game was called Conquer Canada. Um, well, at least it was alliterative. Yeah, exactly, because, you know, <laughs> games had to be. And um, the uh, Canadian friends of my, my parents weren't particularly thrilled by this. They, you know, were visiting at the time. They're like, Conquer Canada? What the hell's wrong with your kid? You know? <laughs> um, but my, my early uh, RPG designs were, uh, I, I did a, a superhero system that was fairly heavily influenced by Top Secret in as much as it was a percentile system because to me at the time that just seemed to make logical sense that, you know, I would have a strength of 85, which would mean that I have an 85% chance, and and that's just, that makes sense, and it's, I'm sure it was awful. I cannot find it, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but yeah, those were my those were my baby steps in, uh, in like, ninth, 10th grade. Yeah, and in one of my earlier roundtables, we were talking about that, and I mentioned that my first game actually was a, was a spy game, in which uh, which was you know entirely handwritten, and in which I spelled the word pilot wrong every time I used it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, the funny thing is, is that um, I uh, my best friend and I, who is still my best friend to this day, um, we designed a Star Wars role playing game in the mid-80s, before there was a West End Star Wars game. And we did it by handwriting in some um, vintage Star Wars spiral-bound notebooks, which now I look back and go, my God, if we hadn't written in those, they would be worth a little bit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, of course, now I, God only knows what happened to those. And, and my, friend, my friend David now you know, denies all knowledge that we had ever done that, so. <laughs> <clears throat> so as, uh, uh, again, back to the James Bond thing, as, uh, as a James Bond fan, a very important question is, um, who's your favorite Bond? Oh, that's a rough one. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, could, I could be a, a not entirely um, copping out here and say that my favorite Bond is the literary Bond. Because not a bad, and really, for a lot of people that haven't read James Bond, I, I don't think a lot of them realize that it it actually is kind of different. 
Then. I started reading them. I, mean, I, I had seen the movies first, but I started reading them when I found a, a copy of Casino Royale on my parents' bookshelf when I was like 12 or 13. And, of course, it, at the time, hadn't been made into a serious Bond film. Yeah. And so it was a story that was completely different from the things that I had seen on screen. And I was hooked. Um, Ian Fleming, to this day, remains my my favorite author. And, um, in fact, I named my son after him, uh, Ian. Um, but um, I would say that, that the literary Bond is my favorite Bond. And in my head, um, when I'm reading a Bond novel, regardless of who's written it, um, I sort of picture this guy in my head who looks a little bit like everyone who's ever played him. But not exactly like any of them. Yeah. And to, and to be honest, um, it's one of the things I really liked about the, the James Bond role-playing game is that the art that they used took that... Yeah, that, it was sort game. of like an amalgamation of, yeah. of different people into it, right? But uh, <laughs> film-wise, um, I, I there are no Bonds that I don't like. Um, I would currently say that as far as uh, being able to accurately portray the literary Bond, I would go with Daniel Craig. Yeah, I I was a big um, Sean Connery fan until um, I started seeing the Daniel Craig movies, and then he kind of bumped it up. And I think that um, that Timothy Dalton is an underappreciated Bond. Definitely, he well, came he came at a really bad time, and you know the franchise was in bad shape, and really it wasn't a good time for. He only got. He got one movie that was written for him, and it was it torpedoed by budget. Yeah. His first movie was actually written for Roger Moore, so it didn't suit his style of performance. Um, and even that, even but even with that, it's it's one of my favorites, Living Daylights. Um, but the yeah, second film, which was written with his Bond in mind and was supposed to be a, a, almost a proto Daniel Craig, if you will, a grittier, more realistic take originally was supposed to take place in China and and involve opium warlords and things. And oh, the, problem, was... the problems with MGM put the kibosh on that, and they, uh, they moved it to a fictional South American country, and it played like a bad episode of Miami Vice. Um, but to, be, to, to an extent, the same sort of thing happened to Brosnan. Uh, his first movie they looked like they were it, it had been originally written for Dalton so it was kind of darker uh, but as Dal but as uh, Brosnan's movies progressed he became the second coming of Roger Moore uh, with completely over the top you know super heroic goofiness which was a shame because he really could have handled the the kind of the darker element a lot better I think I I think if they had kept it like that it would it would have been better than they the sillier things that we ended up getting with his bond. So I think I think that Daniel Craig greatly benefited by the fact that that uh, they had tried it going a little darker before, and also benefited from the the as far out as the Brosnans had gotten. So it gave them an excuse to do literally a sort of a hard reboot, which made people much more willing to accept uh, uh, this sort of radical interpretation and it always strikes me as funny that it's a radical interpretation that goes back to pretty much exactly the the character in the novels yeah yeah because I mean the character in the novels was a bit of a of a bastard and just um, you know, not really a nice guy but you know the kind of person that gets things done when you a know. blunt instrument as they yeah. say yeah mm -hmm. well I mean and and the the Casino Royale that they did is, apart from a few elements that modernize it, damn near a word-for-word -word adaptation of the novel. Yeah, which is which is brilliant. Um, as long as we're talking on the the topic of influences, and and I asked you about them uh, before the the uh, hangout went live, why don't we talk about the pulps? And sure. uh, um, I mean, you're known for having done a lot of uh, pulp-oriented things between Thrilling Tales or your Mars mm -hmm. books. Um, <clears throat> why are the pulps uh, so important for you? Um, honestly, I think it's a factor of um, growing up in the 70s and the 80s. Um, 
the the pulp reprint paperbacks of the 60s, um, by the point I was in uh, my adolescence, had basically worked their way into the used bookstores. And so um, I had this total cornucopia of, of pulp reprints that were that were real, uh, like readily available and really cheap at the point. Yeah, the, where... those Bantam uh, paperbacks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those things, I mean, they were just great the, little the, books. The, the, the Doc Savage reprints with the, uh, with the James Bama covers, the, uh, the Shadow reprints with the Steranko covers. Mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of the, you know, the early 80s especially was sort of a kind of a pulp revival mode. Um, you had Dave Stevens launching the Rocketeer and 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 stuff like that. So that just happened to coincide. It was sort of right in my uh, my field of vision, as it were. Yeah. And um, and the, you know, obviously the Indiana Jones movies too were a big uh, sort of sign pointing me in that direction. You know, hey kid, if you like that, you'll like this. You know. That kind of stuff. Uh, were you a fan of a lot of like the old serial stuff too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, obviously it was pretty uh, goofy, but um, <laughs> you know, and, and and it was goofy enough that I knew it was goofy. Um, you know, because you're talking to a kid who for whom the the 1966 Batman, I I didn't really get that it was campy. I thought it was just the coolest damn show ever. I'm sorry. Yeah, and it wasn't until I was older that I went, oh, this is supposed, this is sort of, you know, taking the Mickey out of it. Got it. Uh, but like the the Flash Gordons and stuff with like the the, the sparks trailing out behind the, uh, the 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 rocket ships on strings and stuff, and it was no Star Wars. And and at, no. you know, I was living, breathing, eating, sleeping Star Wars at that point. But. Um, I was exposed to a lot of it, but generally I preferred the books. Um, so, uh, of of the you know the, the the heroic pulp characters, which ones were the ones that you kind of gravitate towards more? Uh, Doc Savage, de definitely at the top of the list. Um, the Shadow's cool. I I I, uh, I read a bunch of that mostly because it was readily available. Uh, but if as far as Dark Avenger of the Night characters, I prefer the Spider. I love the spider. He's um, my all-time favorite pulp character. But Doc Savage was sort of... <laughs> it's almost like getting a sampler platter. You know? Because you had, you had Doc, but then you had all of his supporting casts. And from story to story, the tone could be entirely different. I mean, you could have a jungle adventure... And then the next story would take place entirely in New York City and involve like a super science villain. Yeah. And so it was uh, sort of a pulp greatest hits thing, you know. Well, and, and Doc Savage also, I think, is good from a, a, an RPG um, angle because you've got the you know an adventuring group. Mm -hmm. they, they might not all be exact equals, but you know you, you've got the you've got the different specialists, and you know each each character really has their their niche in the group, and then you know you have Doc who has all of the niches, and yeah, exactly. He's he's sort of your um, pulp version of a utility infielder. <laughs> um. So, but what what about what is it about the the you know the pulps that made you want to? To, to do the games that you've done about them? Well, mostly it, it was... Um, I I like doing games about things that I enjoy personally. Uh, the long-running... Uh, the the, the, the long-running gag uh, in the industry was that game designers love pulp, uh, but the game market, not so much. <laughs> and um, when the PDF thing was starting to hit really big in the in the early 21st century uh, like 2000 to 2002 I realized that it was my opportunity to do a pulp thing where I didn't need to reach so many people that it would be viable in print um, and so it was just sort of well you know damn it I'm interested in this uh, in the old model of game design and publishing I, I would 
either not do it or lose my shirt. Um, but with the digital publishing, I could take the risk. So damn the torpedoes, pretty much. You know that also brings up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, you know, an interesting um, thing of the change in the market. Um, you know, from the publisher standpoint of how it's gone from the old of the you know offset print model where you'd have to do you know twenty thirty thousand copies of something to break even and the you know the the uh, p the easy for me to say the PDF or uh, POD uh, model where you know you break even at like thirty mm -hmm. and um, I, I you know you're obviously one of the uh, the publishers who sort of rose to the top in that as that was changing over and um, do you think that has um, do you think that has um, sort of uh, uh, colored the perceptions that of you that maybe some other publishers might have in the industry um, I don't know if I can make that question vague or um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure where you're going. Yeah, with um, well, I mean, it's do, do you see a lot of of resistance from those who are still in the like the old school approaches? You know, you have oh. the big print runs, you do offset print, you know, you do a a, a full no. color. Mostly, the resistance you see at this point is on the retail side. Most publishers at this point realized over the past decade, uh, some earlier, some later, um, that by not doing digital, they're literally leaving money on the table. Um, first it was, you know, well, real publishers don't do that, that that's just, you know, essentially like the modern version of fanzine publication, that it's, it's just some random gamer and all you need is a copy of Acrobat and an internet service provider, and you can call yourself a publisher, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but as those people who were calling themselves publishers were suddenly being able to pay the rent entirely on digital sales, that argument slowly went away. Um, some folks watching this may remember back in the days when, when RPG Now and Drive Through were two different companies. Um, drive through basically made its business on converting old school publishers to digital. Um, that they, they saw what RPG Now was doing and basically went to the, the, you know, the, the, the traditional publishers of the world and said, you could be doing this. If you give us your books, we'll create digital versions and blah, blah, blah. And that, that was sort of their business model. Um, so they did a, a large, amount of the of the legwork to get the the for lack of a better word old school publishers um, onto the digital train so to speak um, later on in that decade it became you know the, the 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 sort of final arguments and I think maybe you still have some holdouts today um, who are saying no I'm not going to do digital because if I do that everything I put out is, is going to be pirated um, most of them don't hold on to that opinion very long once they realize that even if they're not doing digital, their stuff's being pirated anyway. Um, and well, and that still makes some of them very, very cranky. Yeah, oh, yeah it does. But you know, um, as I pointed out, when when wizards took their PDFs uh, out of the market, I said your stuff is still going to get get copied, the only thing that's changed is now you're not getting any money from legitimate sales. Yeah. Um, so you're literally leaving money on the table. Um, and according to the the keynote address for uh, the next version of D&D &D at Gen Con, which uh, I was at Gen Con, I did not attend the keynote, but I heard people saying that apparently they're, they're going to be bringing back digital versions of their the prior stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've read that too. So, so apparently somebody went, "Hey, we are leaving money on the table," and it only took them, you know, a few years to figure that out. Um, but you know, the wheels the wheels grind slowly. Um, 
At this point, I don't think that there's a lot of publisher resistance. I mean, there's some. There's always going to be some because gamers, what are you going to do? But um, most of the resistance at this point is on the on the retail side of things. You'll still hear retailers saying, I don't like that you do digital because it's taking money out of my pocket. But these are the same ones who, you know, when you offer programs for for them to sell stuff, you know, you know, I'll you'll say, oh, here, I'm putting this out, and they'll say, well, that's not a standard size, and it's not going to fit on my shelves. And and then you say, well, okay, fine, I'll create a, a, a countertop point-of-sale display, and they'll tell you, well, my counter space is a premium. And yeah. it's like, they want you to create stuff that's going to sell itself, and, you know, if I do that, then why do I need them? Right. Well, and, you know, these are also mostly the same people that are just selling the, you know, the the, the last 12 D&D source books. Exactly, and yeah. But they have, <laughs> but they have, you know, despite the fact that they're, that they're stocking, you know, essentially 1% of what the market is offering, um, they have very, very clear opinions on what the other 99% of the market should be doing, whether or not they're act- actually ever going to stock them. Um and and will let you know rather loudly that that you are failing in their eyes. Um, it's it's frustrating, and and I continually find myself going back to something that um, I heard Mark Wade say uh, from from the comics world when I uh, I attended the uh, the ICV two conference on comics and digital, which was right before uh, the New York Comic Con in two thousand ten, or maybe it was two thousand eleven. No, it's 2010. And um, he was talking about the movement of comics to digital, and of course, comics retailers hate this idea. And he said, you know, it pains me to say it, but in this country, um, we've, we have entire states that don't have a dedicated comic store. Uh, it's estimated that um, we only have something like 2,500 active retail accounts uh, for for comics distribution, and he said, and as as an industry, we can't allow ourselves to be held hostage by twenty five hundred retailers. Yeah, and yeah. and and when I heard him say that, I said, "Wow, that sounds really familiar." Except and, it's a larger number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna I was gonna say dedicated game stores were probably looking at less than a thousand, but yeah. And there's you know some overlap with those comic stores. But it's not a very popular position, and it's one I'm well known for taking. And so um, I do get some bad rep uh, out of that. And, and, well, you're, and, you're probably used to that, though. Well, the thing is, is the thing that's sort of lost in the translation, and I, and I keep trying to reiterate it, is I used to be a retailer. Um, I ran... I, I was the assistant manager of a comics and games store in Atlanta in uh, the from from basically eighty eight to ninety. Um, I worked at a regional comics and games distributor for a couple of years, um, and I worked at a comic uh, uh, was the games manager for a, a comic book store um, in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, for a couple of years in the early nineties, and it's like. Every time I get into the this sort of discussion, I keep telling these guys, look, it's not that I'm, you know, like, oh, retailers suck, blah, blah, blah. I used to be one of you. I get it. I know the kind of stuff you have to deal with. But the problem is, is that, and you know, as much as it, as much as it sucks for the folks on the ground, the ground is shifting, you know, and and I, I, I'm not at the point any the, the numbers are not at the point any longer where I, where I can afford to do things purely to be nice to the retailers. Yeah. You know, I mean I, I would like to to include retailers wherever possible and I do make the effort to do so, but um, it's not a huge part of my business model anymore. Yeah. So now if there if there was one thing you could tell retailers to kind of get them on on board with you know the newer models of things, what would that be? Um, honestly, um, 
develop a website. It's 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 positively shocking how many game stores don't have one. Yeah. Um, and it's a simple matter if you have a website to contact RPG Now Drive Through and set up an affiliate thing where your customers going to your website can then purchase digital stuff and your store gets a kickback. So, yeah, they're still buying digital stuff, but at least you're seeing something from it. You know? And and I was beating my head against that particular wall at the Gamma Trade Show for a few years. I was running uh, panel discussions and seminars trying to get retailers to, to, to recognize that, that they don't have to be left behind on digital stuff if they just adapt so that they can share in it. And after doing it for three years and in some years not having any retailers attend the panel, um, I, I gave up. Um, but, yeah, basically if I was going to say one thing, it, it, it's, it's take advantage of the opportunities that are already out there. Um, um, through my work in Cubicle 7, um, uh, Cubicle 7 is, is a, a partner in the, in the Bits and Mortar program, which is a situation or it's a, a group of companies that if if uh, if a gamer buys one of our physical products from your game store we give links to the game store that they can download digital copies and give them to their customers as as a value add yes, but trying it, to tell that to my local game yeah store. but trying to get retailers to sign up to it is is you know I, I've joked in the past that, you know, the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. In this case, the horses won't even be led. You know, yeah. we're, we're trying to drag them there, and they're not even, they're not budging. Yeah, so. I mean, it, it, it amazes me sometimes how kind of under-informed a lot of game stores are, because, you know, like, um, using uh, something from Cubicle 7 as an example, a couple of years ago when it first came out, I wanted to buy the the Doctor Who game from my local game store. And they didn't know about <clears throat> They didn't, yeah, they didn't even know it existed, and I ended up getting into an argument with the guy, their game guy. That would be and, this one right here. Well, no, I have, I have the, the, the one with Tenet, but, uh... <laughs> that, that is my, my, my shiny new, uh, uh, author's copy of, of the new edition that I picked up at Gen Con. Yeah, I have I have the new PDF, but I don't have uh, I, I don't have a physical copy of, of the new but version. Yeah, I mean, and any gamer who has been to a game store um, ever, yeah, has heard uh, that that hasn't come out yet, or uh, we can't get that, or it's out of print. It's out of print, or it's sold out, yeah. and and I guarantee you, ninety percent of the time that is not true. Oh yeah. Um, I know I've had a lot of, of arguments with game stores over the years. I remember, you know, ten years ago, trying to convince the, the game store to buy uh, that I wanted to buy something. I'm like, I've got cash right here, and it is. It's like, well, no, that's not in print. No, I know it's in print because I went to the effort of emailing the people that are doing this, and I know for a fact it's in print. No, 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 that game doesn't exist. No. <laughs> in in some cases, you know, to be fair, it's it's the 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 retailer being being sold a bill of goods by their um, distributor rep who just couldn't True. be bothered. Yeah. Um, but usually it's it's coming down to the retailer themselves. I mean, I, I've had, you know, at the time I was working as a retailer, I had distributors tell me things were out of print when I had the publisher in my store telling me otherwise, you know. Yeah. So it, it's, it's... I suppose the... the, the the most fair way to put it is that the entire industry, every step along the chain, is dysfunctional. Yeah. They're, they're, in, not not in the modern psychological sense of the word, but in the literal "it don't work" the way it should. You know. Yeah. The, I mean, the the distribution system for for gaming is just has been s severely broken for a long time, and it's just now starting to to shake out to where it's. You know, starting to actually have an impact on on 
well, I mean, everybody from the publishers to the people trying to buy. Yeah. Just in time for everything to change. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, talking about Gen Con, um, this year you were a, uh, a guest of honor. Yes, I was. I'm sure that was that was quite a um, no pun intended. It was quite an honor. Uh, what, how did it, how did it feel to you know? It's be... funny. It's really funny because there was a there was a joke uh, that was going ar- around between some of the guests of honor, um, which was that this is a, a a strange new translation of the word honor, which means here have six to eight hours additional work. <laughs> Um, and, and, and it was, you know, it was all in good, in good fun, but, uh, you know, nobody was, was genuinely put out or anything, but, um, occasionally, um, you know, it's a situation where it is my busiest show of the year, um, doing work for not only Adamant, but Cubicle 7, um, and also setting up consulting work for like the next year and, and, and all of that. And then on top of that, uh, guests of honor um, participated in panel discussions and seminars and things like that. So very, very well, busier than I've ever been before. And I had to make myself at least two, three times a day stop and make a note of of where I was and what I was doing and the company that I was... I was part of the, the 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 people that I was lumped in with, and what it all meant, um, and would get pretty overwhelmed by by just how damn cool it was. I mean, if you had if 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 you had gone back in time and told like thirteen year old me, you know, reading Dragon Magazine back when they used to put the Gen Con events, the events catalog as an insert in Dragon. And I was looking at all of these events going, that sounds like the coolest thing ever, and I'm never going to get to go because it's halfway across the country. <laughs> that 30 years later, not only will I have been going for 20 years, but I would be a guest of honor. And uh, that just b- blows me away. I, it's, in all seriousness the 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 pinnacle of my career that so far nothing i've done has made me prouder than than being a guest of honor at gen con this year did uh, did you find that people were treating you differently like maybe taking you more serious or you know the funny thing is i don't know if they treated me differently but i did notice that i sort of had an in- in- increased um presence an increased exposure more people knew I was there, which led to people seeking me out um, and and telling me that something that I did really meant something to them, which is which is the best thing ever. But I mean, I had a guy come up to came, came up to me on Friday um, to uh, he said, I, I I bet you don't remember me, and I said, you know. I, I'm sorry, I don't. I, I, I meet thousands of people. Um, and he said, well, I didn't expect you to because um, I was one of your first customers back at, like, Gen Con 94 when I was selling my first commercially published RPG, which we only published, like, we only printed, like, 500 copies of it. And it was a, a sci-fi game called Periphery. And he was one of the first people who had bought a copy from our booth and had me sign it. And he just wanted to come and uh, he, he said, you know, when I found out you were going to be a guest, I went and got my copy of Periphery, but I left it on my coffee table. I forgot to bring it. <laughs> he goes, I was going to have you sign it below where you had already signed it. <laughs> and I was, I was blown away because again, this is a, you know, there's 500 copies of this thing in existence. And, um, and I had people coming up and saying, oh, you know, I really enjoyed Underworld, which is something that I did like 12 years ago. And I just had a lot more of that than I've ever had at any Gen Con previous, and it's because we're essentially promoted. We're in the book and everything else, so people know we're there. 
and um, and that's even aside from just the, the 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 people who attend the the panel discussions, which were almost uniformly packed. Which is a good thing. I mean, it's a yeah. good feeling, you know. It really is. And, but anyway, sometimes I would sit there and look, you know, down the line on the panel and be like, okay, I'm sitting here with, with Steve Kenson and Matt Forbeck and, and <laughs> um, you know, Dennis Detwiller and Wolfgang Bauer and, and, and you know, all of these people. And I'd be like, really? <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm waiting for, you know, I'm waiting <clears throat> for the, you know, the fraud police to show up and say, get that guy off that stage, you know? <laughs> See, I feel that way just when I talk to them. Let alone, you know, if <laughs> it's like, you know, why, why, why are these guys, let, you know, listening to what I have to say? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny, and and you know the, you know, I got to meet more people too that I hadn't met before, and uh, uh, Susan Morris and and Elizabeth Shoemaker, and and it was very cool and and very. Um, and very collegial since we were all there as as guests, but again, I'd have to catch myself and go, "I'm I'm in this group." <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I I know from um, um, the discussion you had of Periphery in in one of your uh, Google Plus threads that uh, rights issues probably preclude this, but if you could revisit one of those older games like Periphery or Underworld or whatever, and you know do it new for the 21st century, uh, which, which would it be and, and what do you think, how do you think you'd approach it now, looking at the old material and, and the new? You know, to be honest, I don't think I would, just because there haven't, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much proud of all of the designs, um, and obviously, you know, they're there are things that I would do differently as far as, like, you know, the package, you know, as far as, like, oh, I, I would get more art and I would do it this way or change this layout based on what I know now or that kind of thing. But um, I'm more interested in doing new stuff than revisiting older stuff. I mean, I had thought for a while about doing a new version of, and I've had people ask me, actually, about doing a new version of uh, Hong Kong Action Theater. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it it's really a game of its time. The, at the time that I did that, Hong Kong film was sort of a hipster thing. Yeah. And now all of the tropes of Hong Kong film are U.S. movie tropes. Yeah, part of mainstream movie yeah, making it's, now. Yeah, it's, total, it's totally been mainstreamed. And, and you know... I don't want to sound like psh, I was into it when it was cool, but it was, you know, it wouldn't have as much of a cachet. It, it, would, it do, doesn't have as much reason for it to stand on its own now, as opposed to the genres within Hong Kong films like Wuxia and things like that. But, but um, I, I would have to say that, that uh, I would... And I and I've talked with the, with my uh, with, with the guy who actually currently owns the rights, um, who is no longer in the game industry. Um, my my old partner Matt Harrop owns the rights to Periphery, and we've talked about the possibility of of revisiting it. But the funny thing is, is that that when I start going down that path, I own, I almost always find myself more interested in taking the setting and doing something else with it like a web series or you know rather than going back and doing a game um death mostly because that's sort of where my interests are are lying now it's i i've still got some game stuff that i'm doing but now when i start coming up with with ideas for new ip games aren't my first choice for platform I'll, I, I'll think about them in terms of fiction or, or, or digital series or comics or whatever, because I want to explore everything that's, you know, uh, everything that's available to me now, uh, because we're in, a, we're in a time when, when a reasonably motivated creator can literally do anything. Um, and, you know, I joke uh, with, with my wife and my friends that it's, you know, must be you know, must do all the things, you know. 
it's like, you know, <coughs> why, why would I want to do another game when I can take that idea for a game and instead do an animated series? Why? Because it would be, like, a ridiculous amount of work. Don't tell me that. I'm <laughs> going to, you know, it's... Yeah, I know you've mentioned a few times about uh, uh, when you get into comics. I know you're a big fan of comics as a medium. The, pr the problem is, and what keeps holding me back, is my realization that to do it right would be a full-time job by itself. Yeah. Um, I, I look at the way things are, it's, it's really frustrating. I look at the way things are in comics right now, and I realize exactly what I would do to do a comics publisher the way I'd want to do a comics, comics publisher. I can see it clear as day. And, and, you know, with things like Kickstarter, getting funding for it is a possibility. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've been really amazed at how comics um, as an industry has been embracing Kickstarter. Yeah. I mean, you've been seeing some really big names like, um, you know, Mark Silvestri's latest with, uh, you know, relaunching yeah. Cyberforce for free using uh, Kickstarter. Exactly. It's, it's, so funding isn't the stumbling block anymore. The stumbling, you know, it, early on it was, as a creator, your stumbling block was if you were a writer, you needed to find an artist. And, and that meant that you need to have money. And so funding was the stumbling block. And, you know, that's, that's funding for development, not even for production. But now funding isn't the issue anymore. The issue is time. Yeah. Um, because as clearly as I can see the things that I would do that would create, I mean, that would create a, a, a great, successful 21st century comic book company. Right down to, I mean, I can see in my head the marketing plans because I'm weird like that. Um, <laughs> that sets you apart from a lot of uh, game publishers, too. <laughs> but, but I realize that to do it and not half-ass it, it would basically have to become my full-time job. And I've already got four of those. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't see yourself like, you know... Uh, you know, packaging the stuff, putting it, putting it together, and then you know, approaching another publisher like, say, Image or something like that, and and let them um, handle the the publishing heavy lifting. No, um, mostly because I am uh, not only am I a a, um, a very extreme advocate of of what I refer to as creative insurgency. Where, where the, the, the creator not only uh, has direct control of their, of their property, but they also have uh, control over every aspect of the production um, and, and distribution. I wouldn't want to farm that out to somebody else. Uh, also, I'm pretty much a control freak. Um, the, uh, I haven't... I mean, I've been running my own stuff for so long, it would be very hard for me to shoehorn myself into someone else's structure. Um, but, and, and, and honestly, I look at what's going on out there uh, with comics right now, and I'm like, I, I don't understand choices being made. Big companies don't seem to be fully embracing digital to the extent that they could, that could change everything. And then folks like Mark Wade with his Thrillbent site are, I think that it is absolutely 100% on the right track, but it's baby steps. He's not going big enough. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact he doesn't want to scare the crap out of the rest of the, of the, the comic publishing or right. you know, producing people because, I mean, you know, we talked about, about uh, you know, game publishing being conservative. Uh, you know, comics publishing is still pretty much, hasn't really evolved much past the, you know, the 1930s and 40s when, you know, it was a bunch of, like, bootleggers and gangsters running the comic industry. Well, now, now the, the bootleggers and gangsters just have more money. They're corporations. Yeah. Um, and you're starting to see, I think part of the reason you're seeing a lot of the, the, the Kickstarter stuff from big names is because the big names are chafing against uh, the realities of working for these big media corporations. The minute that Marvel and DC, you know, DC was acquired by Warner ages ago. Marvel being acquired by Disney, 
the point at which they become subsidiaries of those companies, they stop becoming IP generation, right? And they they become essentially holding tanks for for the existing IP. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think you're seeing a lot of that in in contemporary comics. And so, the the fallout that you're seeing right now with uh, creators jumping ship from DC and and willing to go on the record saying this is bullshit. You know, there's you know uh, incompetent editorial oversight and and you know you people like George Perez and Alex Ross and and uh, and Rob Rob Liefeld are willing in public to say, yeah, I'm not working for them anymore because they're a bunch of asses. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting because you're, uh, you know, you're talking about the, the all the recent, you know, vocal DC defections like Perez or, or Liefeld. You're also starting to see a lot of, of people right. that aren't being, yeah, like, like Judd Winnick, uh, who, or, you know, or not a huge or, loss for me, but I mean... But it's it, happening on the Marvel side of things too. Yeah. I mean, Ma Mark Wade coming off uh, Winter Soldier. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, no, no Brubaker. Brubaker. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Brubaker and then, pretty much leaving Marvel comics altogether, yeah. and but, I mean, but not making a big deal out of it. You know, just yeah. sort of. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be doing my own stuff now. Yeah. You know, it's it's. I think that that's going to accelerate, and Marvel and DC are basically going to become. Um, you can have Brian Bendis writing everything. Well, actually, I honestly see them in the next five to ten years basically becoming Archie. Not in content, but think about it. Can, can you name anybody who writes or draws for Archie? No, no, not but, really. But they, but they crank out titles yeah. monthly. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, they crank out a number of titles. Right. And so they basically become, and, and apologies to the guys and gals who work on Archie Comics, but it's essentially hack work that yeah. that you have the house style and you have to do X many pages and, you know. And I think that, that these giant intellectual property management agencies that used to be, you know, active publishers are going to be moving in that direction where... Well, we need to make sure that we produce X many pages of Avengers so that we can keep the movie property hot. Yeah, you know, um, and you know, you might still have some aging, you know, aging superstars who are who are you know cashing a check that they can use for marketing purposes. But I think generally it's going to be a lot of uh, art institute graduates and 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 folks who are basically just doing it as sort of make work. Yeah. While they, while because because they can't get a design job or an illustration job somewhere for you know they're gonna they're gonna crank out some comics for a year or two and. Oh, while they're while they're working on their own thing. Yeah. That they're going to use Kickstarter to launch, you know. Yeah. But uh, and it's kind of depressing, but you know. But, you know, and then so that's when I look at the things that you could do to avoid that, especially with as many big creators jumping ship, it reminds me very much of that, that sort of early to mid-70s period when Atlas decided to make a run at the, uh, at, at, at the big two. He was ironically back in publishing. <laughs> yeah. But I, could, I, I, could, I see the market right now as more than ripe for for lack of a better word, a digital atlas. Yeah. Uh, who goes after the, the, the dissatisfied names and offers them, you know, creator-owned platforms. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I think, uh, well, except for the digital part, is really what, what Image has been doing lately is, I mean, you've, you've seen a lot of announcements, that, like at San Diego or um, Toronto this year, of you know a lot of big name people who wouldn't normally have been doing image titles, like you know Grant Morrison and people like yeah. him, suddenly putting out like three and four books from, you know, through Image. The problem is the problem is is that um, that's still locked into the the twenty five hundred retail accounts. Yeah. Uh, you know where a top selling title sells eighty thousand copies. 
Yeah. You know, um, and I think part of the problem is that Image, for better or worse, still has their early 90s reputation. Yeah. Um, where it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's, it, they're not exactly known that they're, that they're uh, you know, style over substance. Yeah. You know, that kind well, of as thing. I say, 90s, the 90s comic sensibility seems to be rearing its ugly head a lot in comics again. I mean, you know, well, look, at, look at pretty much anything that DC is doing anymore. I mean, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that so much of their, their upper levels now are former Marvel people from the 90s. Yeah, Jim Lee, etc. Yeah, so. But I mean, and 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 the last time I worked in comics as a retailer was the height of the uh, early '90s speculation boom. And I'm looking there, and I'm looking at what's going on now, and I'm like, does nobody in the business remember this? No. You know, I I see Dynamite Comics and IDW releasing multiple covers and chase covers and and I'm like we are only a hair's breadth away from the foil cover yeah. and uh, you know and like I saw someone someone say on a on a Google Plus thread recently in the last couple of days and uh foil foil covers lead to the clone saga yeah <laughs> yeah pretty much i mean yeah and and you're starting to see you know like uh uh valiant titles are coming back now yeah, you know, Bloodstone and Rye, and 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 I'm like, you know, I know how the story ends. See, we're we're gonna start, you know, someone's gonna start putting out, uh, you know, Warriors of Plasm and and uh, yeah, and, and barbed wire, and then you know the whole thing blows up. Yeah. Um. Why don't we go on and talk about <coughs> um. You you do have a, a few things that are in I guess the final stages of development, yeah, or varying final stages of development. Um, you've got your Kickstarter uh, for Far West. You've got um, your work with uh, China Meville. I hope I said his name right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know the Buckaroo Banzai game. Um, you know stuff for icons. Uh, what sort of uh, what sort of timetables are you looking at on some of those for? Um. Within the next month, four to five weeks, six at the outside, uh, we will see the release of the long-awaited uh, third Icons book, Icons Team Up. Um, I'm actually finishing that up right now, um, the layout, etc. Uh, the uh, Far West role-playing game... Um, we it's been about a year since uh, the Kickstarter. We we are about six months behind schedule. Yay! Um, for various reasons, not the least of which, to be honest, is that we succeeded far beyond our ability to uh, react quickly. Um, when you're expecting to only have like a hundred, hundred and fifty backers and some of those backers are getting custom adventures, and some of them are getting portraits done and things like that, and then you have almost 800. Yeah. It, it tends to front-end the workload a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, and that, that brings up an interesting point with, because uh, uh, we didn't really talk about Kickstarters much, but, um, you know, I think that something is people put in these, these levels, uh, you know, the pledge levels on Kickstarter and go, thinking, wow, that would be really cool if I did X. And then they find yeah. out after the fact that it was a lot more work than they thought it was going exactly. to be. Uh, I was in um, a number of different panel discussions at Gen Con on Kickstarter, as you might imagine. And um, in every one of them, you know, the question inevitably came from the audience, what would you do differently now? You know, what was one mistake you think you made, etc.? And... Um, I've had a year to do post-mortem, basically. Um, and I think that one thing that anyone doing a Kickstarter should, should, should think about is that everything you're doing is going to take you much longer than you think it will, uh, especially if you succeed beyond your initial expectations. Um, 
And so to that end, on stretch goals, I would... I'm not entirely sure that uh, that when I do another Kickstarter that I'm going to have any stretch goals. Um, just because when you take into account the extra cost of delivering things, they don't actually add much to your take. Yeah. Um, and when you t and when you factor in what many people in our business forget to factor in at all, which is to pay for your own time. Yeah, you're, you're actually looking at a money losing prob prospect because you 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 don't once you take into the account uh, take into account the extra money for producing the stuff for the stretch goals and the amount of extra time it will take you to produce that stuff. You're you're really not adding to the ability to do the original thing, which is to make and, the game or the book right, right, or the right. comic. Well, yeah. So in future, I think I'll be a lot more conservative, um, and and that may take some training of the audience because I think that the that the Kickstarter participants are now expecting stretch goals. Yeah, they're expecting swag. Well, swag is one thing, but the idea of well, we've we've passed our goal. If we reach this, you'll get this extra thing. Yeah. is the is where you start treading on thin ice. Um, but yeah, so so the additional success led to more work, which delayed us. And then we had uh, uh, our artist Rick Hershey uh, had some had some personal issues, which delayed us. And then um, eventually he decided uh, we decided that 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 you know he'd be better off moving on. And and so that left us in a situation now where we have a shortfall. And I'm I then have to to uh, source additional art. And the thing is, is that this is stuff that we're communicating every step of the way to the Kickstarter backers because that's sort of what they signed up for. Um, they they want to see how the sausage is made, basically. Yeah. And... Um, Do you think that's a good thing? I think so, because... Um, I mean, I know that... I'm, you know, I, I like process, so it fascinates me when I see how other people do stuff. And I think that for a large chunk of Kickstarter backers, when they're funding something being done, they want to feel like they're part of doing it. Um, I think that there is a, a, a non-insignificant portion of Kickstarter backers who view it as nothing more than a pre-order and don't care. Right. Um, but um, I think generally it's a good thing. Um so yeah, um, we've been delivering uh, unlaid out manuscript text to our backers who just wanted to, to see some of it and be able to comment on it, which uh, allows us to effectively crowdsource you know additional content um, that if if they feel that we're we that we weren't clear about something or they think that there should be an additional example or whatever they let us know and it's a chance for them to. To, to sort of contribute in that way before we even go to the PDF stage. But um, within a month, the PDF will go to the backers and the printer. Um, the commercial edition for folks who weren't in on the, on the Kickstarter will probably hit stores, I'm guessing, around November. Uh, it just, just take I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be through Cubicle 7. Yeah. And... Uh, Buckaroo Bonsai um, will be, uh, we're in the uh, delivery to approvals stage. Uh, it was Which funny. is always got... the fun stage with licensing. Yes, and so I, I don't talk much about that, mostly because that side of it is, uh, is out of my hands, and I don't want to uh, make promises that are dependent on, on, uh, on the Bonsai Institute being able to take time away from saving the world to say, yeah, you guys are good to go. <laughs> or squeezing um, watermelons. Exactly, exactly. Um, now, uh, Tales of New Crobazon, which is the game that we've been doing for uh, the, the Baslag books of uh, China Mieville, um, will be an early 2013, I'm guessing. Again, that's got to go to uh, approvals as well. But... Uh, it's a situation where um, uh, we're we're using um, 
uh, basic role playing licensed from Chaosium, which was China's uh, favorite. Uh, Call of Cthulhu was his favorite game when he was a player. So, so he was he was really chuffed to find out that that we were going to be using mm-hmm. that rule system. Uh, when and, and I'm you know when 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 an author of that caliber you know who's who's given given you the license to do a game says oh it would be so great if we could use my all time favorite game system <clears throat> any ideas that I have at that point about doing an original system yeah goes out the window I was like you know what this is a game based on your books this was your favorite system it is possible for us to use it we're gonna use it um, and it's a it's a pretty good fit too. Um, that sort of uh, that sort of weird fiction angle really really makes it uh, click very nicely, um, and yeah. So I'm expecting. I mean, again, it's going to depend on 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 China's schedule once we get it to him for approvals, but um, I'm shooting for March April, um, just because I would like. I would like by the time that next year's Gen Con rolls uh, rolls around that I don't have any pending projects. Hmm. You know that I that I can just say here's this cool stuff. Let's play it instead of um, you know being behind schedule on another big project. You know because the the past the past year and a half two years has been had largely feel like a big game of catch up for me. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, you don't you don't really it, until it happens. You don't consider becoming too successful to be a burden, and then it's like, holy crap, what do I do with all this? Yeah, it's it's you know like, um, and and it's interesting because you know I started out Adamant as a design house in like two thousand, and then we we became um, our own thing in in two thousand four. But it's only been the past couple of years that we have been what anyone outside of the uh, of of you know my family would consider successful. Um, I viewed success as is it paying the bills, and you know if it was paying the bills, then I was perfectly happy to say yes, it's success. Uh, I don't have to work for anybody else. That means it's a success. Um, in the past couple of years, it's been successful enough that it's actually successful, successful, and um, I've discovered that 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 you know, in the immortal words of uh, of of, of uh, the notorious B.I.G. Mo money, mo problems. <laughs> uh, the uh, the Steve Kenson once told me this thing. He's like, you know, working for yourself is great because you can work whatever hours you want um just pick 80 of them per week um and and that's one thing i think that a lot of uh, a lot of folks in the uh, um on the uh the playing side of, of 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 games don't realize exactly what it is that fills our days you know that we're not actually playing <laughs> games that much um and the amount of work that we have to do is pretty heavy um and it's and it's not fun stuff either it's you know it's really interesting things like liaising with printers and sourcing paper shipments and you know talking to accountants yeah and and and, and it's uh you know i do consulting and, and occasionally i get hired as a consultant by someone who wants to start a game company and the first thing i always tell them is um, if you're starting a game company because you love games, don't. Um, start a game company because you love companies. Um, because you're going to spend most of your time LARPing as a businessman <laughs> and, and very little actual game, you know, game writing or game, even game playing. Um, and, and, you know, the, the thing that I would the analogy that I would use is uh, make sure that what you make sure that you know the difference between wanting to be published and wanting to be a publisher because those are two different things yeah. and and that if if your goal is to get your game out there just find someone else to publish it and and uh, 
that that that's my official wet blanket <laughs> position, which I always you know at upfront hit people with, and I know that they're going to ignore. Yeah. So well, uh, it, kind of at the at the end of things. Um, <laughs> At the the you know the plus side, uh, you know you talk about not getting to to, to game very much. Uh, what what sort of uh, games are you a- actually getting a chance to play right now? What 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 games are out there that, that have got you excited? That uh, well you know that that's that's two different questions because unfortunately, literally, I have not had a chance to play anything in almost a year. As sad as that is to say, well, uh, I I have. My my uh, my local friends saying, so when do you think you're going to be ready to run a game? <laughs> and I'll and and my my answer for the past year has been, oh, it should only be another couple months. Um, mostly because every you know, I, especially with uh, being behind schedule on such big big projects, um, I feel like every minute that I have where my brain isn't fried, I should be devoting to catching up. Yeah. Um, which is, of course, really frustrating going to Gen Con and seeing all sorts of new stuff and going, oh, I want to play that. I have no time. Oh, I want to play that. I have no time. Um, but, yeah, there's been a lot of stuff that's come out uh, that I, and, and I picked up at Gen Con that I'm thrilled by. I have no idea if I'm ever going to get a chance to sit down and play it. Um, uh, Ken Heights Knights Black Agents, uh, which is uh, well, his his elevator pitch is uh, the Born identity if uh, if Born discovers that Treadstone are vampires. <laughs> um, uh, the the new Marvel game I I finally picked up a copy and it's brilliant. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Cubicle Seven's Doctor Who game, and 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 I had a chance to play it a while back, and I w- would like to do so again. Um, I also picked up uh, also from uh, Cubicle Seven the new um, Norse fantasy uh, uh, Yggdrasil. Yeah, I've se- I've seen I saw the PDF of that get yeah, put out, which is. A gorgeous book, but aside from that, is also just a, uh, a time period and a, and a subject that I'm personally interested in. So, um, the last game I actually that I had a chance to play, which again was uh, almost a year ago, was The One Ring, um, which I enjoyed. Although I find it um, as a player, because I was I was actually playing and not not running that, I find the setting intimidating. Well, there's so much there. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, you kind of feel like an, a, a bit of an imposter, you know? It, it's like... Like you're doing bad slash fic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, it's like you don't want to do anything too drastic for fear of, you know, tipping Professor Tolkien's boat, you know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, there's so much stuff out there that I'm, that I'm interested in playing. Yeah. Um, and you know that is the curse of the game industry is that there there's you get to see all of the cool stuff and seldom get to play any of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's it, this is this is really one, I think one of the the golden ages of of gaming. There's just so much stuff and so much variety of you know genres and play styles and just you know what is available for for gamers and there you know. Yeah. I don't think you could even, you know, have time for like a tenth of it. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I have to say that if I was to pick one thing that is at the top of my list that will be played come hell or high water, it's Fiasco. I mean, I've had it for, you know, since it came out, and I've, I've, you know, devoured every play set, and I have never gotten a chance to sit down and play it. I've written a play set. And I've never gotten a chance to sit down and play it. Yeah, I saw when they won the Diana Jones last year. Yeah, it was. Uh, and and uh, if people have gone on uh, on YouTube and checked out uh, t- the tabletop episodes where they play it, it gives a really good indication of what it's like. Yeah, that show I think is is uh, going to do a lot for for various forms of tabletop gaming. 
Hopefully, hopefully. I mean, if even if nothing more than just letting people know that we're out here. Yeah. Yeah, because we're definitely not as visible as we were in the in the 80s when, you know, you could buy gaming stuff out of the Sears Robot catalog. Right. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for for uh, taking time out to, to talk, Gareth. Uh, it, was, it was a really fun time. I hope, Happy you, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I certainly did. Uh, this is... <coughs> This is my uh, my first hangout, actually. So I'm wow. Uh, I, I I feel kind of honored to have to have taken your hangout virginity that way. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's only a little bit. <laughs> um, but you know, it would it wouldn't be game industry related if we didn't have awkward creepiness. Somewhere. Yeah, that's that's, oh, that's so very true. <laughs> <laughs> but thank, right. thank you very much, and um, have a good night. You too.